Going back to that little video, that is a great story. Uh, my wife and I have known uh, Chris Duffy since he was 14 and knew Amy, the mother of those two young men, since she was in junior high. And that is a great story. We're very glad to be part of a church that provides and produces stories like that. Well, the day after Thanksgiving, this past fall, my wife left for a two-week trip to Malaysia and Singapore with her 90-year-old father. It was a big-time trip for her, and she was looking forward to it, but that meant I was going to be left home alone for two weeks. Not exactly alone. One of our boys lives with us who's finishing grad school. So the very day after she left, um, maybe the day that she left, we were going to watch a movie, so we were going to make popcorn. And when I make popcorn at home, I make it the old-fashioned way. I put oil in a pot and put a couple kernels in, heat it up until those two pop, then I pour the rest of them in and make real, you know, movie theater quality popcorn, which I did. And when we were done, I decided um, not to clean out that pot <clears throat> because we were probably just going to make popcorn the next day, and it seemed kind of inefficient, kind of a waste of energy to clean a pot we're going to use the very next day. <clears throat> Guys, am I right? That makes sense, right? And the third reason my wife wasn't home, she was, he would notice that I didn't clean out the pot, so I didn't clean out the pot. I left it on the stove. Sure enough, the very next day, we were going to make popcorn again to watch a ball game or something. So I thought, ha, see, I was smart. The, the pot's all ready to go. So I poured the oil in, dropped a couple kernels in. Some of you team guys will recognize this story. And began to heat it up. And I was waiting for those two kernels to pop to tell me when to put the other kernels in to make the popcorn. And they just never popped. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And it seemed like it was taking too long. So then I wanted to take a peek and I just peeked in like that, and the whole pot just burst into flames, like two-foot-high flames. So I'm standing there, and, I, and I, I don't panic very often, but I panicked. I didn't think clearly enough just to put the top back on it and smother the flames. So I'm running around the kitchen with this thing on fire, yelling at my son, open the door, open the door. And I, I ran out the back door onto the deck and put it out on our deck, and it's still just flaming. It's a grease fire. I don't know what to do, so I go back inside. What do you get? I know I can't put water on a grease fire. I knew that. Well, what? Flour. I think I was thinking baking soda, but I, got, I grabbed the big thing of flour, ran out, and just dumped the flour on the pot to smother the flames. Now, I stopped the flame, but I had a problem on my hands because the pot was just charred beyond recognition, just black. And I tried to figure out what had happened. I think what had happened is that the previous day when I made the popcorn, I had salted it in the pot, again, to be efficient, and didn't clean it out. And the next day when I poured the oil in there, there was still salt in there. And I think the salt in the oil might have changed the flash point of the oil, caused it to heat up weirdly. And so when I opened it up, the oxygen rushed in and whoosh, fire. I'm not sure, but I think that's what happened. But I had a problem now. Uh, I had made a mess that I couldn't clean up. And I knew my wife was going to come home in two weeks. She was going to go, what happened to my pot? Because I was going to have to explain that I almost set our house on fire making popcorn. So I scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed. I just could not get all the black off the pot, which she eventually did once she came home, which she reminds me of that she cleaned it up. But I had made a mess that I had not been able to clean up. We're in a series now from the Psalms called Songs of the Soul. And today we're going to look at a psalm that's about making a mess that you can't clean up by yourself. We're going to look at Psalm 32, which is a psalm written by King David. But before we get to the psalm we're looking at today, we need to look at a different psalm. We need to look at Psalm 51. And I'm going to put these on the screen. Psalm 51 begins like this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, many of you know that David uh, wrote those words after the greatest failure of his life. And we have a record of it in the Old Testament. After he made a complete mess of things with a woman named Bathsheba who was another man's wife. You remember the story? Uh, David is walking on the top of his palace. He sees this beautiful woman and he desires her. So he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And then he tries to cover up his sin. And then he eventually sends her husband Uriah to the very front lines of battle. And there he is killed. It's a really sordid story. David then is confronted by prophet Nathan who confronts him with his sin. And David repents recognizes he, what he has done, and he responds by writing Psalm 51, which is the psalm of confession. And toward the end of Psalm 51, he writes this, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. So many Bible scholars believe that David wrote Psalm 51 as his own confession of his own sin, and then he wrote what we call Psalm 32 to teach others about confession. So, today we pick up Psalm 32. It's called a maskil of David. The word maskil is a Hebrew word that can be roughly translated as teaching. So this is a psalm intended to teach. I'll read all the way through and then we'll break it down. David writes, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Now the word selah most likely means a kind of musical rest for reflection of what was just said. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I'm going to break this psalm down into three things today. First I see is the call to confession. And second will be the way of confession. And then lastly, the joy of confession. Let's begin with the call to confession. A number of years ago I had a conversation um, with a young couple who came to me to be married, I think, and in the context of getting to know them, I asked about their faith backgrounds and their faith stories, and the young man said he'd been raised all his life, uh, most of his life, in the Roman Catholic tradition. And in the process of telling his story, he said that by the time he was about 17 years old, he and his high school buddies had figured out this whole religion thing, he said. I said, oh, uh, tell me what you mean by that. And he said, well, uh, we found the uh, the, the church in town that had the earliest possible mass we could attend on a Saturday morning. And so we would all go together and we would pre-confess all our sins for the weekend. And I said, oh, you mean like a sin credit card? He said, exactly. And I said, well, you know it doesn't work like that, right? And he goes, well, I do now. See, he had the confession part right. He just had it kind of in the wrong order. David here says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. He's telling us that the call to confession begins with the problem of sin. The call to confession begins with the problem of sin. David here uses four words to describe sin. The word sin itself comes from a Hebrew word which means to miss the mark. What the New Testament calls falling short of the glory of God. An example might be, you know, losing your temper at home or with a friend and saying something that hurts someone you love. It's falling short of God's standard for us. The, other word, the next word he uses is the word transgression. That's the Hebrew word pesha that carries a sense of rebellion. It's refu one who refuses to submit to authority. It's committing a rebellious act. An example might be, when I was a young boy, my dad uh, made a rule, no rock throwing in the yard. I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, and I threw a rock and therefore violated his rule. It was an act of rebellion against authority. The third word he uses here is iniquity. That's a word that carries a sense of being, of that which is bent or twisted, crooked, it's a perversion of God's intent, of that which is right. For example, David in his life committed adultery with Bathsheba. That's a perversion of God's intent for marriage, iniquity. And the last word he uses here is deceit. 
That's a word that means to cover up, to, to live falsely. It means hypocrisy. Perhaps the greatest example of that historically in my lifetime would have been the Watergate scandal when President Nixon tried to cover up his illegal activity. Now it occurs to me in thinking about all these words David uses for sin that our modern culture no longer really uses those words. We don't use the word sin or iniquity or transgressions. We don't talk like that. The word sin is considered outdated and hopelessly old-fashioned in our culture. We tend to use now different words and expressions for sin. We say things like, it was poor judgment, or it was just a mistake, or it was an unfortunate decision. All these are just euphemisms for the old-fashioned word sin. We might not use the word, but we all know what it means. I mean, just watch the, the reaction on social media or on uh, TV media or newspaper media when a politician or a celebrity uh, commits a, a, a lie or is involved in an illicit, illicit relationship. The, the re response is outrage. We don't use the word, but we know what it is. Or maybe a professional baseball team is caught cheating in competition. Outrage. We don't use the word sin, but we all know what it is. The Bible teaches us that no matter what we call it, sin is a problem. It's a problem because it's universal. New Testament teaches that all have sinned, all have fallen short. The Bible teaches sin is a problem because it destroys. You know, sin is a problem not because God just arbitrarily decides certain things are wrong, he doesn't like them, and he wants to keep us from having any fun. Uh, sin is sin because it destroys. Sin eventually destroys everything it touches. It destroys relationships, our relationships with others. It destroys our relationship with the holy God. Eventually, it destroys our souls. Sin always kills. That's why the Apostle Paul says the wages of sin is death. Sin's a problem. And that's where confession begins. Because the psalm is teaching us that the call to confession promises the blessing of forgiveness. Now we notice that David here uses multiple words and phrases for forgiveness, just like he uses multiple words and phrases for sin. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. That's a Hebrew word that means a burden that's been carried away. And it points back to the Old Testament practice of the scapegoat, Leviticus chapter 16, to symbolize the forgiveness of sin, the priest would, would conduct this ritual in which he conferred the sins of the people onto the head of an animal, a goat, and then they would drive the goat out into the wilderness to symbolize the sins of the people being carried far away. Forgiveness. Then he says, blessed is the one whose sin is covered. It's a different word. It's that which is now out of sight. That which has been covered or clothed. Again, the Old Testament says that through the blood of the animal sacrifices, sin is atoned for or covered. In the New Testament, we are taught that the blood sacrifice is not of animals, but of Christ himself. And because of his sacrifice that covers our sin, we are clothed in his righteousness. Covered. The third phrase we see here is, he says, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. That includes the words that means does not count against or is not charged against. It means it's the charges against us have been canceled. In other words, someone else has paid the bill. So David is teaching in this psalm, which is actually a song to be sung, that sin, whatever we call it, is a mess that we cannot clean up ourselves. Rather, only God has the authority and the resources to forgive and make clean again. And he does so through the sacrifice of blood. No longer the blood of animals in the Old Testament, but the blood of Christ himself. That's the first thing. Second thing we see in this ancient song is the way of confession. The way of confession. Um, I think it was my junior year in college, I was selected to be uh, what we called a hall counselor. And I think most schools call it an RA, residence administrator or something like that, assistant, resident assistant. And I was responsible for, along with my roommate, a whole floor of freshman guys. 
Toward the end of that year, you know, we're almost at the end of the year, it was about spring break time, and my roommate and I um, were on the way to the student union one night to get some food. It was like midnight or just after midnight, the student union was kind of always open for that. So we took a shortcut through the academic building of our campus, which was also always open, just the way it was. And as we walked through this deserted hallway in this academic building, my roommate, just, just out of the blue, looks up at the ceiling tiles in the ceiling and says to me, as we're walking, think I can break one of those tiles? And I looked up, and the ceiling was about nine feet. Uh, he was a swimmer, and I was a basketball player. And I said to him, there's no way you can jump up and break one of those ceiling tiles. You can't jump. He looked at me, and he jumped up, and he punched the ceiling tile and broke it right in half, and it fell to the floor. Just a dumb thing to do, college thing to do. And he, he looked at me like he was challenging me, like I did it. And I looked at him. I'm like, I'm a basketball player. I can do that. I jumped up and I broke one too. Broke two ceiling tiles. They just fell on the floor. It was a dumb thing to do. It was technically vandalism, right? But we just laughed about it, dumb college guys, and kept walking and got our food. Well, went to bed. The next morning, we wake up and there's a note attached, uh, taped to our dorm room door. It says, the dean would like to see you in his office at 10 a.m. We're like, oh, we are so busted. Somebody must have seen us. So we dragged ourselves to the uh, dean's office that morning. And as we walked in... He looks up and he says, what in the world were you guys doing in the academic building at midnight? And we just blurted out our confession. Oh, we, we, it was just dumb. We're, we're so sorry. It was the wrong thing to do. We'll pay for all the tiles. It will never happen again. He looked up and he started laughing. He goes, you mean you guys did it? He said, I thought you might have just seen who did it. Here's what David says. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So David here offers two very different personal responses to sin. When I kept silent and I acknowledged my sin to you. First, when I kept silent. Now this, I think, is almost always our first response when we sin against God or someone else. That is, we hide. We deny. We act like it never happened. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden when they violated God's command. They hid from him. I saw it was in Ohio visiting my parents this week. Picked up a paper one day. Headline story was a guy named Daniel Jones who was um, accused of killing his girlfriend in a, in, a, in, a, in a fit of rage over an argument. And for two years, uh, even though the evidence was very clear and overwhelming, for nearly two years as he awaited trial, he pled innocent. He insisted on his innocence. Someone else did it. It wasn't my fault. I wasn't there. Couldn't have been me. It was an accident. And then just one day before his trial, this has been two years, one day before his trial, he suddenly reversed his plea to guilty. The judge asked him why he had changed his plea. And he said, quote, I got to get this off my chest. I can't live with this anymore. And that's what my roommate and I felt as we stood before the dean. We knew what we had done. We knew. It was heavy upon us. Unconfessed sin is heavy. That's what David's teaching. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. And then he gives a second response in verse 5. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you. The word acknowledge means I made myself known to you. I stepped out of hiding into the light. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sins. David is saying we basically have two options. Either we cover our own sins and we hide, which leads to guilt and shame and separation and distance from God, or we uncover our sins, we confess so that God will then cover our sin, which leads to forgiveness. Two options. So here's a question. Does forgiveness, does God's forgiveness depend on on our confession. I'm sure this question has, has occurred to many of you. 
Does God withhold his grace and forgiveness until we confess? Well, I think the biblical answer is yes and no. Here's why. God's forgiveness, as I understand it in Scripture, is complete, is full. The New Testament tells us that our forgiveness has already been purchased by Jesus. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, He forgave all your sin, past tense. He forgave all your sin by taking it away and nailing it to the cross. But confession is what allows me to receive, to know, and to experience that forgiveness. In other words, when we hide, when we deny, when we cover, we cannot experience the forgiveness that is already offered to us. Does that make sense? 1 John 1, we read, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now here's a little question too. How, how do we confess? How are we to confess? I just briefly mentioned three ways. We can confess sort of corporately. We're here together in worship. We sing songs of confession. We pray prayers of confession. We can confess amongst each other in fellowship and friendship, praying for one another. But David here is inviting us to confess directly to God. We are invited to confess ourselves directly to our God, which leads us to the third part of this psalm, which is I'm calling the joy of confession. The joy of confession. Let's finish the psalm beginning in verse 6. David writes, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in a rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like the horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart here. Now David says a lot here, but I want to focus just on verse 7. Let me read it again for you. It says, you are a hiding place for me, you preserve me from trouble, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I think we see a beautiful progression here. First, he says, you are a hiding place for me. Hiding place means shelter, a safe place. We'll talk more about that next week when we look at Psalm 46. But we think about it, why do we hide, why do we keep silent when we have sinned against God. It's because we're afraid, aren't we? We're afraid. We're afraid to be known. We're afraid to be found out. We're afraid of potential punishment. But David is saying, instead of hiding our sin, we are to hide in God. Instead of hiding in ourselves, being afraid to find out, we are to hide in God as our hiding place. He is our shelter. He is a safe place for our confession. When we come to God honestly, in confession, we need not fear. Because he invites us to come into his presence. He says, you are my hiding place. Then he says, you preserve me from trouble. Here's the thing about sin. Sin never delivers what it promises. All the way from the beginning of the story of Genesis, our enemy says, hey, I have something better for you. This will make you happier. This will make you like God. But it doesn't, doesn't deliver its promise. Sin leads to brokenness and shame and destruction. That's what we see throughout the scriptures. That's what we see in our own lives. That's what we see in the world around us. God, rather, wants to protect us. Wants to preserve us from trouble. So David says, you preserve me from trouble. And then thirdly, he says, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Now the picture here in the ancient um, Hebrew world is one of a great victory. It's most likely ref referring to a sort of military victory out on the battlefield against enemies. And they're coming home and they're shouting in deliverance. They're shouting in victory. Now we tend to see this most often in our culture. In, um, for example, sporting events. The winning team 
celebrates, right? The victorious team celebrates. The players will shout and scream. The fans will line the streets and shout and scream in victory. This is the image David has. And he's teaching this from his own experience. Because his sin, his failures led to guilt and shame and death. But when he confessed his sin, when he uncovered it before God, it led to forgiveness, victory, and joy. And that's why he writes in verse 10, Many are the sorrows of the wicked. David knew those sorrows. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now, I mentioned um, earlier that when I was a young boy, about seven years old or so, uh, my dad made a rule, no rock throwing in the yard. And there was a reason he made that rule because, um, and I've told this story many times before, I was a boy, I liked to throw rocks. I loved to throw rocks. In fact, I, I had discovered I could throw rocks all the way over the trees in our backyard, which created the problem for our neighbors because they live right behind those trees. Therefore, the rule, no rock throwing in the yard. Well, one day, one thing led to another with my buddies, and I think one of my friends, so-called friends, uh, who knew the rule, Told, said to me, I don't think you, I bet you can't throw a rock over your garage from here. I was like, I can throw a rock over the garage. And so I picked up just one rock, and I tried to throw it over the garage, and it went like a laser-guided missile, and it hit the one window right in our garage door. So I broke a window, throwing a rock in violation of the rule. My dad comes home, he noticed the window, and he asked me about it. So I pretended I didn't know. I'm not sure how good I was at pretending. He might have known from that day. I don't know. But I pretend that I didn't know. I'm, mm, that's weird, you know. <laughs> In other words, I hid from that. I, hid, I kept silent. And I kept silent for about 20 years. <laughs> don't look at me like that. <laughs> no. And one day, uh, my dad and I are driving somewhere after college now. After college. And that broken window was still on my mind. I still remembered Right? That's what the psalm says. Your hand was heavy on, on me. I still remembered. So I got up the nerve, driving somewhere. I said, hey, Dad, um, you remember that broken window in the garage a long time ago? And he actually had to remind him about what it was because he had kind of forgotten. And then he goes, oh, yeah, what about it? I said, well, <sighs> truth is I'm the one that broke it. I, uh, I threw a rock, hit that window, and, and broke it. Um, he was quiet for a minute. And then he said, I figured it was you all the way along but I forgave you for that a long time ago, he said. So here's the deal. I was forgiven. I'd been forgiven for a long time, but I could not experience and receive that forgiveness without confession. That's why David says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Bow in prayer with me before we conclude our service in kind of a unique way. Lord, thank you for the ancient words of instruction David gives us out of his own experience. Thank you for your provision of forgiveness and for inviting us to you in confession. Thank you for being our hiding place, for covering our sin, and for surrounding us with shouts of your deliverance and joy. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Please.